Welcome to Expedition Self with Sam Parado, a lifelong learner and entrepreneur. Sam is the creator of the growth-producing worlds of Expedition Self, where seekers hang out so they can live a conscious life of love and personal fulfillment. As she shares four decades of studying, guiding, and teaching, you'll learn how to go inside and build an empowered relationship with the self. Ignite your self-development process with Sam. Good evening. It's great to see you. Thank you for being with me tonight. <clears throat> I'm Sam Prado. It was a little bit of a quiet introduction there. Uh, I'm your host uh, for this hour-long variety show about growth work. Um, well, I'm going to take a big deep breath tonight. Uh, I like to start each show with two questions just to help you drop into yourself. All right. So the first one is, what are you working on within you right now? What was present for you during the day? What's going on in your life this week? And since I last saw you, what has been playing out in your life? Hmm. Oh boy, yes, that's a great question. What has been playing out in your life since I last saw you? So tonight we're going to talk about freedom and the show is called Freedom is an Inside Job. And uh, I mentioned uh, to my significant other that I was doing a show on freedom. And <laughs> all he could say was, wow, that's a very big subject. And then he said, write that down, write that down. So I, I wrote it down. And so with that said, he's right. And hopefully we'll be able to help you think a bit about freedom through the going inside lens. And maybe you'll get a better sense of it for yourself too. Yeah, you know, I have been thinking about how many messages are bombarding us each and every day. I mean, about thousands of things, but particularly the living your best life. And, you know, in some ways, our conversation about growth work could look like mm, it's just another message about living your best life. And no matter where you turn, it's all the same. Um, and, and this is true about all of these messages. But I was uh, watching John Stewart give one of his monologues, and he, he mentioned how we are flooded with more words right now than has ever been true in history. And of course, he was saying that much of the wording is designed to elicit or ignite outrage or some kind of a reaction uh, that causes people to feel something. Well, this show even though we're using a lot of words and everything we think about growth is designed to have you listen and work with your own inner words, yours, so that you don't have to use the external world as a mm, provocateur <laughs> right, for you to feel. Uh, and what lives inside of you is so rich, so uh, important and essential to you being able to feel as if your life uh, is meaningful and, and supportive and uh, expressive, right? And so all these messages, they're really, they're calling you forward to be fully engaged in your life and in mine, because if you're engaged in your life, I get to experience you some way or another just because of the ripple effect, right? And when you get called forward, it makes the challenges and the difficulties, well, more worth it or justified in some way. So it's so easy as a person to just exist and then have a whole bunch of feelings about why it didn't go the way you wanted or why you're now in a situation you don't like. Every single day I hear about someone who got their heart broken in their life or were completely disappointed or betrayed and then never recovered to actually go out into the world with their whole self, whatever that meant, you know, or some past situation that didn't work out. Now the person involved doesn't want to ever be in a situation like that again. You know, there is no guarantee that putting yourself in into life committing is going to translate to you living your best life as you define it. But there is something to be said for feeling like you gave it your all, like you were a true student of life. You know, that student mind has everything to do with tonight's conversation about freedom and 
the growth fundamental we're going to talk about, which is about being unconcluded. And so my wish for you out of the conversation is that you are reminded to put yourself into your life and allow life uh, to provide you with more of what's available for you to learn about. Okay, so that was kind of my intro. Uh, so what's ahead? Uh, in the fundamentals, we're gonna talk about being unconcluded. And during the communications, ownership, relationship, and emotions, I always forget exactly, even though it spells out core, I still have to think about it. In that segment, we'll be discussing defenses. In our community section, we're going to drop in on Armenta and Umberto having a conversation about her needs and his reaction. And uh, lastly, if we have time, we'll spend some time talking about timelining. Oh my gosh, I think I said four times in there. And the overlay that you can add from this show. And actually, if there's even more time, um, I will read Maya Angelou's uh, I know why the caged bird sings, which is so perfect for a show about freedom. All right, um, so slide two, we're ready for. Uh, I just wanna take a moment, each show we provide show resources uh, that you're gonna want to check out. So go to expeditionself.com slash TV resources and you'll see this. Uh, and each show we create different uh, like pieces to keep you engaged and to give you deeper experiences. So I really, I hope that you will go check it out. All right, slide three. Chris is, uh, our producer is back there helping me with slides. So um, this is the section of the show where I talk about these basic fundamentals of growth work. And so you'll see circled on the slide uh, that we are going to talk about being unconcluded and just to jog your memory, during the last show, we talked about keeping the flashlight on yourself. Where is that? Oh, I do have my flashlight. Okay, here we go. There we go. Keeping the flashlight on the self. Um, and, it, you know, just to kind of bring that back, if the idea is if the flashlight is on you, and oh, oh you can let this slide go and just let me be on the screen now. Thank you. Um, so the the issue of this flashlight on the self is that we love to assess everyone else's behavior. We, we love to um, figure it all out and then know that we got the answer about it, right? Uh, and so that flashlight on the self, what that's there to remind you of is that the only thing that matters really is what you think and what you feel and what you're doing with it and what's happening at a being level, right? Okay, so if you take that as our starting point of keep the flashlight on yourself, then tonight's subject is this idea of being unconcluded, which means uh, when you're concluded, it means that you put a period at the end of all your thoughts and feelings, like they're done. You size up circumstances before they happen using past experiences as a basis for like, the justification of how you're sizing it up, right? Um, being concluded, it keeps you safe in knowing. And we love to know, right? Because it gives us this comfort. A lot of times that means knowing you're right too, which I think the ego loves, right? Because not just knowing makes you feel comfortable and safe, but then knowing you're right, wow, that's like the, that's like the big win. Um, but it's the equivalent of a locked gate or a closed door or a dead end. And your mind enjoys it without realizing what it's costing you to go through life being concluded, right? Because you don't look at life as if it's possible. Like you don't look at the moment as what's possible here, right? Um, and so, it, when you're not looking at what's possible, then you're not looking for opportunities, you're not looking for new choices, right? If you think you know why your life has gone the way it has, or if you think you've figured out human nature, or you have answers for all the difficult moments in your life, or you think you understand the universal questions, like all, all of it, right? Down to knowing that someone is smiling a certain way because they're not telling the whole truth, Truly, being concluded is a way to get through life and limit your capacity to transform. 
and and so when I think about being concluded, um, what happens is that there's a part of me that is in fact happy doing it. I really like knowing stuff. I mean, look, I'm here on the show and I'm talking about things I I've experienced and kind of have a sense of what I know about them. But what actually happens is that if I don't always keep that door open on the side that I don't know, maybe it's not what I think it is. Maybe that isn't what I really am all about. Maybe that isn't how uh, that situation went. Maybe I didn't see all the pieces about it, right? If I, if I keep that going, then I, I invite, I invite help. I invite others even without realizing it to give me more information. And so I don't do life so alone. And so the way I try to do that is literally just to think question mark, think student, think blank page, right? And if you think about a question mark, right? I'm going to drop backwards. I think that's the way you would see it, right? Um, but if you think question mark, right? It just all of a sudden, instead of period at the end of a sentence, it's the question mark. It's like open like invite, welcome, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Um, let's see. I just want to mention that you can find the entire 15 fundamentals on that resource page. So, and we'll be working through a different one uh, each time that we do a show. Also, it looks like S Stephanie is commenting. Your idea of being unconcluded has been a big mover for me. Oh, that's cool. It allows for more in my life. Yes, it's it so does. Um, I, the one thing I will say about things when we talk about them conceptually, like let's be unconcluded, uh, is that unless you bring it into your moment, into your hour, into your lunchtime, into a specific day, what happens is it kind of stays at that, like, what I would say, generalist level. And really, growth work requires that you... Um, you find a way to bring it to mind when you're actually doing life. And so putting a question mark on your dashboard is a really cool idea. Or um, putting in your calendar, you know, every third day, are you unconcluded? Or going into a, a circumstance or a conversation or whatever, uh, where you say to yourself, I'm going to be unconcluded here. I'm going to keep myself as open as I can be before I just keep closing things down. All right. Um, I also want to invite you to write to me if you have questions or also to call in. And I'm trying to remember the phone number, actually. Um, so I'm requesting, Chris, can you give me the phone number or can we put it in the chat for people if you'd like to call in and share a little bit as we go along the way? Because even though it's a variety show and we're changing our conversation a little bit at a time. There it is. Oh, thank you, Chris. 202 Five seven zero seven zero five seven. 7057 That's the phone number that you can call in and talk with me and um, and maybe share one of your own stories and maybe, you know, give a sense of how this lands for you. Okay, so, okay, I'm going to get my wand here. We're going on to the next subject, so we'll look at slide four, which looks like it's up. All right, we are about ready to, there it is, there it is, communication ownership, relationship, and emotions. Uh, I want to just tell you for a moment why I feel like these are important, is that these, to me, are the four kind of core pillars of relationship work and uh, exchanges in life that uh, support you in creating the things that you want. And they also weave together. You can't be a great communicator if you don't value relationship, if you're not in touch with your emotions and you don't have ownership and aren't willing to be in ownership. Uh, so they, they really, they weave, right? Like they're infinity symbols in between uh, themselves. So, uh, so far we've talked about how to better communicate by speaking in I, I think, I feel as two separate aspects of this of the self being shared right in the last show we talked about an aspect of communicating that deals with both how we listen and how we engage which i call ping pong uh, and that whole if you go back to that show ping pong is this idea about how are you actually 
being with someone else rather than always think about what you're going to say next or what what it is that you want to respond to so that we start learning what listening really is, which is getting in the other person's world. But today I'd like to talk about defenses, right? Like how being protective shows up in communication and, and why we're defensive. And so I'm going to give you a list and let's just see if you can connect yourself with some of these examples. I can tell you <laughs> that I am connected to every one of them and I have done that. <laughs> so um, repelling an incoming comment. I think I was the queen of that one. Talking over someone, uh, changing the subject arbitrarily, right? Just randomly being argumentative just for the sake of doing it engaging in a conversation and seeming interested, but doing nothing, avoiding subjects, becoming reactive, right? Like letting your temper, your emotionalism kind of grow, you know, go crazy. Hearing criticism, right? Um, thinking you're in trouble or have done something wrong and rationalizing. A lot of times uh, defensiveness doesn't look, you won't, how do I say this? A lot of times there are ways of being defensive that don't look defensive at all. And, and so I think for myself as an example, I didn't really see some of the ways I was defensive really well into my 50s, and I will probably see it in my 60s too. Um, it, it's, it's kind of like we trick ourselves into thinking we're open when we're actually defending and we're actually self-protective. Why do you think that you need to be self-protective? Why do you think any of us feel the need to be self-protective? What, th what do you think it is we're protecting? What do you, what do you think uh, is in place that makes us want to keep people at a distance uh, from whatever that, that is? Uh, I would invite you to think about that question. I have some thoughts about this subject, but you know, one of the ways we do beginner mind and one of the ways we do student mind is to ponder a question like that. Why do I feel the need to be self-protective? Why do others feel the need to be self-protective, right? Like when you ponder these things, it, you, you start to see that all human beings are doing the same thing and it helps us become one and it also helps you to uh, become more empowered in yourself. But one of the things I'd like you to understand is that if you don't open things up within yourself, you can't be open with others. If you don't open things up within yourself, you can't be open with others. And so how, how, you could say, how does this affect deep and eager relationship? Like if another person is met with defensive behavior, it's like they're rolling around on a sharp pointed ball, you know, with a hundred little darts sticking out of it, right? How likely will they be to share their own vulnerable information if they are met with a response like that? Now, what I am not saying is, oh, just open yourself wide open and just throw yourself everywhere. No, because it's about being uh, real with it. So I could say, I am feeling bunched up here. I don't want to share this, right? The more we can speak what's true. So thank you, Denise. You think that's a great list. That's awesome. Well, uh, I'm glad you found use in it. Okay, so I say this about relationship because it has come to my attention in the last couple of years, oh my gosh, in such an acute way that the relationship we form with others has everything to do with how we feel about our life. Like you can have all kinds of other things. You can have talents, you can have a wonderful like environment that you live in. You can have all these other human experiences. But when, when you don't have really meaningful, deep relationships, it affects the quality of your life. And so communication of our inner world, when you can communicate it, it causes those relationships to deepen. And, and they develop a resiliency, an ability to be tolerant and talk through challenging things and differences, right? And then they get healthier. 
and ultimately more fulfilling. And so, you know, the thing about growth work is that you're developing this relationship with yourself, but ultimately what it does is it allows you to develop a relationship with life and with other people and with money and, and with your health and with your job, because you, whatever goes on on the inside, however it shapes itself up is the way it goes on the outside. All right, so what do we have here? I have Diane McKinley here. I think I don't wanna feel vulnerable and exposed. It almost makes me freeze and I don't know how or where to pick it up where the other individual would be as open as I would like to be. Well, you know, I do just wanna say right there, you are actually not being self-protective because you're describing it in such a way that someone can feel the vulnerability in that, right? And that's all it takes is just this idea that we describe where we are at any given moment and then it actually opens the door. Thank you uh, for writing that, appreciate it. Okay, I'm feeling done with that conversation. I'm hoping all of you have a little bit of uh, food for thought. Uh, you can always write me at hello at expeditionself.com. Um, I think the other thing, if, I, if I'm ready to change slides to slide five, I think it's actually up, isn't it? Um, we are offering daily dispatch. And what it is, is it's this reminder that comes over your text stream. It's not very long, right? And it, I think it's 160, whatever the number of characters are, but it's words to help call you back to yourself, to help think about actually where you are and what's going on for you just a little bit every day. And the reason this matters is, you know, we are talking about everybody's bombarded, bombarded with words, but the idea is to put words into your space that remind you to keep the flashlight on yourself and remind you about defensiveness and remind you to think about, I think I feel. <laughs> Diane says, I love this new edition. So here's what you do. You call, you uh, put in your text the number 866-269-8545, and then you uh, write the word join. And when you do, you'll be signed up and you'll get words about growth work uh, every day uh, in your text stream. Anyway, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. I th you know, I I feel like a lot of times when things are free, people are like, yeah, well, you know, it's got some string attached. We just really want all of, I want all of you and I want my world to be filled with people that want to look inward. So, all right, where are we? We're at 825. So we are getting ready to do our main topic, um, which is freedom uh, is an inside job. So I'm gonna spend, I have a few minutes here. I have about four minutes before we go to break. So I'm just gonna kind of set us up just a little bit, you know. I always do some research with these topics that, you know, beyond what I understand about it or my experiences. And I found uh, some interesting tidbits I'd like to share with you. Um, so they, uh, one of the pieces I found was that when thinking about freedom, it allows the longevity and stability for any people within a civilization state, like what, I don't think I said that right, but the idea that these things make people free. They require food, energy, and technology. And you know that thumbs up thing? I don't know where that comes from. It just happens randomly. Uh, so I, I'm thumbing up my own conversation here. <laughs> Um, anyway, I found this so interesting because there are no human traits in this perspective, just these physical survival ones. And I, I think there are other freedoms. Uh, for me, most importantly, the freedom to express oneself would be needed. Um, and I found this definition too, that freedom is physical, psychological, and moral. Okay, here's another one. That most people would probably agree that the statement that freedom allows people to build lives of meaning and purpose. Hmm, that's interesting. That's got kind of some dual meanings there, I think. Um, and some say that true freedom means having inner peace and being content with yourself and not being bound by physical movement, lifestyle, or materialism. Um, all right, so let's see. 
Okay, I think I'm going to just stop right here from my notes. I, I want to say to you, you know, besides the thumbs up, I often can do this heart thing. Let's see if it works. No. Nope. And it creates all these little flowing. Oh, oh, look, 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 look. It did it. The little flowing heart. So on that note, we're going to go to break. And when we come back, we'll dive in uh, to freedom as an inside job. Home Times TV. In a world filled with constant noise and distractions, where finding meaning feels like an endless search. Introducing Daily Dispatch, your daily pathway to inner growth and self-discovery. Each day, receive a personalized self-growth prompt. Crafted by a seasoned growth expert with over 40 years of teaching personal mastery. Join thousands of professionals who have found clarity and purpose with Daily Dispatch. Start your free trial today and unlock a more meaningful life, one day at a time. Daily Dispatch. Discover your inner world. Live more consciously in every moment. Get your free trial at www.expeditionself.com slash daily dash dispatch. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in my, my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Okay, we're back. We're back after the the heart burst thing that uh, happened before break. Also, I just wanted to mention, if you happen to listen to that commercial, it says a trial membership is if you're going to get it for free and then not, that's not true. It, you, you get it free forever. So um, I hope that you'll uh, check it out. Okay. So we're now talking about freedom being an inside job. All right. So I think I didn't um, hit this one, which is that True freedom means having inner peace and being content with yourself and not being bound by physical movement, lifestyle, or materialism. Hmm. So the illusion of freedom is that our own needs and gratification come before our commitments to others and maybe even before our own commitments to self. Another way to think about freedom might be there's freedom in being with the self, but maybe not the freedom to act on what you're aware of. Uh, in the body, it, you could think of freedom as giving us mobility. In the mind, it gives us free thinking and creativity, analytics, right? And in the heart, uh, it gives us flexibility and empathy. So why does freedom matter to us and what's the point? I think there is a bigger question that we answer throughout our lives. And that is, how much do we actually want it? How much do we want it? And how do we go about finding it? So I'm of the belief that when you want something a lot, it sets your lifelong learning and study in motion. So even if you begin life thinking that freedom is granted to you by something or someone from the outside, 
you eventually realize that your state of freedom is something you dictate and cause for yourself. When you, when you have lifelong learning, the idea is that you change your opinion many, many times as you study it. Uh, almost to the point of sometimes you reverse your, your perspective, right, or your position, uh, because some new experience happens and it has you see it in a completely uh, different way. So if freedom was one of your most important values, you would eventually see, possibly, that there is freedom inside with the self, but not necessarily the freedom to act, right? If you're engaged in a repeat pattern, well, how much freedom do you really have? And if, if you don't have more than one choice to choose from, well, then what is free about that? Like, where is the freedom? There's a, a scene, I happen to be a Star Trek uh, fan, <laughs> you know, groupie, I think is the right word I was looking for. And uh, there's a scene from Picard when Q, who is this mischief maker of the universe because he, he can go anywhere on the snap of a finger. Um, and he says to Picard, I, Picard asks him, why did you put me through this? Why did I, what I, did I experience all of this? And he says, I wanted you to be free. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but I think it has everything to do with what, what, what really happens when you start talking about freedom. See, as human beings, we are working with this polarity of, I'm going to act it here, expansion and constraint. Expansion and <laughs> constraint. Um, and so if you think about even a planet's gravitational pull, right? The planets are ever expanding and gravity is what keeps them uh, in relationship with each other. So when I think of freedom, uh, it's so important to balance it with some kind of constraint. It almost uh, intrinsically gets defined by nature of having been constrained. And so this is, this is the one of the points I want to make about freedom tonight is while you search for it, for the self, the journey to do so can only be accomplished by having limits or constraints because it's what produces that, it's what it produces, right? That matters when you actually get to the point of having that freedom. If you didn't get constrained along the way, when you get to the point of having freedom, I think there are missing pieces, which I'm going to talk about. So without the experiential processing of wanting freedom and simultaneously feeling boxed in, you, you don't end up in the same place. You don't end up in the same place. So think of a place in your life where you feel constrained. It can be external, like money or some circumstance, like you don't have education or skills you need uh, to accomplish what you want. Or, or maybe it's in a relationship with someone where you want to travel and the other person doesn't want to. This is constraint. And now think about what you have to be with inside yourself, besides uh, like frustrated and, you know, want to throw the glass across the, <laughs> the room, right? Uh, even if you haven't altered the feeling of being limited, notice that you are called to feel this sense of being unable to move or locked up inside of the circumstance. It's this, right? It's right. Like it feels tight. So this produces growth. I know, I know you can't believe it, but it, it really does. And, and even if you've gone through life and you've said, I hated being constrained. I hated what was going on. Even if you have, what I'm trying to say today is no, it produced growth. Last week when um, Benny uh, Ferguson was on this show, he was talking so much about the body and how when you get in relationship with the senses of the body, it feels kind of constraining. Maybe there's a tightness or discomfort. But if you pay attention to it and you give it space to be what it is and listen, it becomes something very different. 
And before you know it, there's an incredible space within your body and the joints and the muscles for movement. And of course, I think it also parallels then the way you relate to your feelings and the way you relate to your thoughts and the way then that you can go out in the world and cause the things to happen that matter to you. See, true freedom only exists when we have a relationship to having been constrained and limited and maybe even powerless along the way. So if we understand this idea, well, then the various ways you can think of freedom begin to take on a different vibe, right? a different feel. If you can redirect your thoughts from the idea that you are granted freedom and instead place the weight of freedom on your inner world, you might notice an inner relationship with yourself that is hierarchical, it's possessive, and it grants authority. It establishes this inner relationship. You might notice that it establishes a special status. It gives it to certain parts of the self and marginalizes others. When we are rough with our inner selves, we then take this into an external manifestation. Now, I just made a left turn there. I don't know if anyone caught it. But what I'm actually saying is that when you really get the idea that freedom is an inside job, then what you also start to see is the inner hierarchy. You know, the boss, the people that work for the boss, the people that aren't really wanted uh, in your inner organization, right? And what happens then is whatever's going on on the inside of us, inside of how we deal with that order, right, that system, um, it starts to then play out on the outside. So then we create we create situations without meaning to do it. We find ourselves in circumstances where other people then fill the role of tyrant, of the oppressor, to be in power. See, people become associated with the certain qualities that you yourself have given value to or diminished, and they play it out for you because somewhere along the way you forgot that freedom is an inside job. And we can't talk about freedom without talking about what you do with your power. Because the power structure that lives within you, that hierarchy, right? What, what part of you gets to be in the lead and say how it goes and what happens to the rest, right? That power structure that lives inside of you is getting played out on the movie screen of your life because of it. So when you're a child... You have authority figures influencing you and telling you what to do and how to do it and feeding you and expecting things of you. And they do it in a variety of, in, of levels of intensity. So some of these authorities do it through fear and guilt. If you don't do it, then this horrible thing is going to happen to you. Or you should feel a certain way because you resist it. Another level of intensity is fueled by the need for the authority figures to be in control and to not feel powerless or helpless or scared. And of course, this translates into the need for you to comply and meet their standards and rules and guidelines. Again, there's constraint in growing up, right? Being a child. So the more emotionally reactive, insensitive, dominating, I mean, I'm going to say cruel or violent, these demands and expectations are, or the less, the more your living conditions reflect it. So in the extreme of the roughness, it feels unsafe, right? Due to maybe socioeconomic conditions or lifestyle circumstances. The more your inner power structure will then be pronounced and extreme, and it's likely you will in some way be a reaction to those who are in power around you. I'm hoping it's, it's, it's making some sense. So it has everything to do with what you do with freedom. And it is the original set of constraints and limitations that set in motion a lifetime of growth for you. This is why, like, I love it or child work. Uh, this is why... It's important uh, to really unpack 
and understand what that power structure was that you were growing up inside of, because it's likely that it's processed uh, inside you. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Wow, that painted a whole new picture for me. Oh, thank you, Denise. I'm glad to hear that. So your inner power structure has everything to do with patterns that get set in place to ensure you have freedom to be yourself somewhere in your life. You figure out how to have autonomy in your relationships, sometimes to the point of withholding your feelings and your expression as a false way to ensure it. Or you may choose jobs that you will be left alone because you can't handle being told what to do. This is one of the biggest factors in my story. I, I went into business early because I could not work for anyone. I could not be told what to do. And if I was going to eat, <laughs> and I had to figure out what I was going to sell <laughs> because at the time I couldn't, I couldn't have anyone um, in authority over me, even though I was not free, right? So are you able to tap into the scenarios I'm talking about? You know, you have an inner power structure that was created by those in power around you that produce these constraints and limitations for your sense of self. And then you've created a lifetime where you find your freedom by projecting that power structure onto the world you exist within and occupy. And this relies on certain patterns and choices and ways of relating to your opportunities. And a lot of times you blame <laughs> the thing you projected on, instead of coming and working on the inside, and it's largely driven. Like the way you manage all this, it's driven by your sense of freedom and how important it is to you and how possible you think it is to get it and the ways you've crafted to make sure you have what you think freedom is. Freedom is an inside job. And because these patterns, as long as you're unaware of them, or don't have alternatives to operating within them, they have you trapped and caged in your own world, even though it might feel free. And then, so it makes the case for why we seek autonomy. We're kind of trapped on the inside, but don't necessarily realize it. So autonomy makes us feel like we are the ones making the rules. Feels good to have that total freedom to act on your own behalf with no constraints. See, the search for autonomy is fueled by our desire to get free of our own constraints and those we perceive as having power over us. So this perceived autonomy, it suggests we have psychological freedom and control and choice instead of feeling as if outside forces are directing our behaviors. And it allows us to feel like we have a sense of power and control over our own destiny. Autonomy and freedom feel expansive. So we're catapulted to want these things because we're in some way constrained and boxed inside of ourselves. We want liberation from this. But the perception of being constrained isn't real. It isn't real. That's what I'm saying, because we actually have total autonomy over our thoughts and our feelings. So if you're unable to stay in a conversation because it ignites your temper, well, you don't have freedom. It may feel like you're autonomous enough to leave it and walk away, but that doesn't mean you're actually free because you had to escape. If you're unable to change how someone is treating you and you stay engaged with them because you would feel embarrassed if you back down, well, then although you have the autonomy to stay, and this may make you feel like you have some level of power, you're not free because of the belief you have about how it will look and not wanting to feel embarrassed. You see, autonomy can fool you into believing you have freedom when really you have no choice but to act in a particular way. Having one choice often suggests you're not free. Something else is running. Having the autonomy to exit anything you don't like doesn't necessarily make you free. And of course, on another note, right, I, I would want to talk about this idea that when you have freedom, 
you are now faced with being more personally responsible. And there's weight to this. So there's something, there's an equation in here, right? I, I am not going to get to other subjects tonight, I don't think, because I ended up working a lot about this. Um, but there's something in this this equation that it's like, I feel like I have the autonomy, but I never realize that I'm actually operating without freedom inside myself. And, and by the way, because of that, I may not have to take as much personal responsibility. So oftentimes, times, you know, when I talk to people about situations where they felt like they were powerless, they'll say they had no power because the choice they saw was too risky or looked very <laughs> undesirable, right? A response like, that's no choice if I have to lose something that matters. But there is still choice, even if it's an untenable one. You just didn't choose it. So personal responsibility, when we have freedom, means that we care about how it goes for others. We don't act independently without recognizing and being conscious that our freedom, true freedom from the inside, has an impact on others. And if we're going to act, then the outcome and the fallout and the reactions are also something we're personally responsible for. So I'm going to give you an example. Think of a member of the family who is unhappy with how things have gone. Maybe they're a little older now. And they begin to speak about how they feel. And when they speak about it, they don't seem to care one iota about how it lands for the other family members. Because they feel so justified and taking, giving their anger a voice and frustration gets to come out. So they've become autonomous. Right? They, they have um, the supposed freedom to speak what they think and feel, but they're not bringing the personal responsibility to the moment, which means it's possible that they do not actually have the level of freedom they think they do, because if they did, there would be the possibility of more than one expression of what they're feeling and one reaction to the circumstances they're in touch with. All right, so I mentioned that I would come back and um, uh, uh, talk about Picard and what Q was saying to him. Q was actually operating as the tyrant or the oppressor or the <laughs> mischief maker or the creator of challenges for Jean-Luc. Um, and Q, because he, in this, in Star Trek, he's often kind of all-knowing a bit, he understood that John Luke was not free inside. And that by creating this adventure and this experience, um, that he would, by being constrained in it and by being challenged through it, he would get to the other side and actually have true freedom because the inside job would be done. Okay, so I, I hope that you liked my my uh, my Star Trek example. Um, okay, we don't have as much time to do some of the things I wanted to do, but I do want to do this um, slide seven. Can you make it full screen? I just want to walk you all through this because I created just this little image for you to help you think about this. And if you want to do a screenshot, this is a good time to do it. Or you can write me at hello at Expedition Self. I'll send you a copy of it. But it's this idea that freedom from the inside down here is what we're doing. And then freedom from the outside, right? And then there's that, that autonomy that looks like it's the big win, right? And then the pursuit of personal gratification. And then somewhere along there, you're assessing the risk. And then what we have there is what I'm calling this moment of friction where you run into something that you either didn't expect or that feels constraining or feels as if it's not what you bargained for. And right after that, with that pink line, you'll see is this inspiration and creativity. And that's when, if you are not concluded and you know that freedom is an inside game, that's when you go back and say, how can I create this different? What can I actually bring to bear? And when we do that, our free will to cause and create things in a better way, it engages. 
And when that engages and then runs through personal responsibility, well, that, now that is a successful equation, right? That is the, the way to think about how do you create the life that you're wanting to create. Okay, I think I'm done with that slide. Thank you. Okay, so um, I had wanted to do some uh, work with Armenta and Umberto, and I'm just gonna tell you because I'm gonna do it in the next show. Um, basically what I was gonna do was play out a little bit of their conversation, and then I was gonna ask you all to help finish the dialogue. And um, there you can see this. We had a way for you to fill it in. You could download this, but we will do this for the next show. So I just want you to know what's coming. And along those lines, the reason our virtual community matters is because the single biggest limiting factor once someone gets engaged in growth work is that they don't know what words to use or they don't know how to express what's actually there for them. And so the, our characters, the idea was that we would help, we would start to create dialogue between them so that you could hear and see how conversation could sound. Because if you don't have anything to compare to, you don't know what you're creating. And so I'm just gonna keep talking about our virtual community and ask your help in uh, filling in their issues and helping our characters come to life. All right, we have about five minutes left. Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm just gonna scroll down to my notes down here. Um, yeah, I think we have time for me to do this last piece. Um, so in the timeline, and that's slide 13, um, uh, the timeline work is in the first timeline exercise, we wanted to capture the big events and occurrences in your life, right? And in the second timeline exercise, we did a spiral timeline and asked you to focus on your sense of who you were, your self-image at a variety of ages. So in this timeline, um, you're focusing on moments when you actually felt uh, a sense of autonomy and uh, possibly freedom, right? And the constraint that goes with it. Right. So what we're wanting to do with your timelines is uh, or your various pieces of timeline are to actually overlay one because it, so it's a big, long line. Right. It's your life. And as you place things on it, then you can do an overlay of another set of experiences. And the whole point of this is so that you start to see your life in many more dimensions and from many more uh, angles and with more nuance. And it helps you uh, bump up against the places you're already concluded. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I, I like to do is to capture um, as much as I can on a certain subject. So since we're talking about freedom tonight, this seemed like a perfect, perfect time. And you can roll in this idea of places when you've been very concluded because likely at those moments, you probably didn't have very much freedom, right? Um, all right, so I think this is, uh, we're kind of at the closing. For those of you who wrote in and shared your thoughts, I just do wanna say thank you so much. Um, it helps uh, to, to have a dialogue going and not just be one dimensional. Um, also, I'm gonna plug Daily Dispatch again. I hope that you will sign up for it. Um, and uh, I feel like it's, it's it's again, the one thing we can do that will support you if you're really engaging in growth work. Um, oh, the creative timeline didn't enlarge on the screen. I'm not sure, Diane, what we're talking about. I don't think I had a, a I, oh, I never did that as a whole thing. Just so you know, I never made it a whole screen thing. Um, so you weren't missing out on anything is the point. <laughs> so, okay, on that note, I will wish you all a wonderful uh, rest of the month and enjoy the summer. And thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please write me and um, focus on the inside. Keep that flashlight on the self. Here, I'm just going to get it. There we go. Keep the flashlight on the self, right? Bring our whole, our whole powerful selves to our lives. Thank you so much.